It's a, it's a great pleasure to have our second uh, Sir Michael uh, Stoker Award and uh, that uh, uh, this is a prize that, as you know, has been uh, uh, chosen, uh, organized uh, and, uh, uh, and thought through uh, by all the PhD students and uh, postdocs of, uh, of the CDR. And today is a great pleasure to have uh, Vincent uh, Raganiello with us, who's, uh, who's the uh, winner of, the, of this year award, that despite uh, Continental Airlines trying uh, their best to stop him to reach us from the States. He has been persistent and uh, and managed to reach uh, to reach Glasgow. Um, I'm uh, slightly inhibited. I have to give a five minutes presentation, but I'm slightly inhibited because in the draft program that uh, Chris and Vanessa and the others prepared, there is all the different time slots and there is uh, 3:30 Massimo Balmarini introduction, five minutes. Uh, Everything is wonderful, blah, blah, blah. And uh, <laughs> so that puts you in focus how people look at you. Uh, so everything is wonderful and blah, blah, blah. But I think how, or maybe you see as a very optimistic, how can we not be uh, happy how everything is wonderful? And uh, I think uh, you probably uh, don't realize the impacts uh, that as students and postdocs have of any organization. I want to give you a, um, uh, a telling example. So on Monday, uh, I was asked by the Medical Research Council Infection Immunity Board to give, provide an update uh, of the CDR. And so I prepared my presentation where I said that everything was wonderful and blah, 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 and that just carried out for 20 minutes. But at the end of the presentation, uh, the first question was a question, but was a comment that was made by Mike Mullin, that as you know, Mike Mullin was uh, last year winner of uh, of the uh, Stoker Award, and he said how impressed he was with the CDR uh, postdoc and students and young people it were exciting projects were doing, and there was such a, a great sense of community and cohesiveness, and it gone on and on and on, and they're just trying to maintain uh, uh, sort of a professional face and, and not like that, and suddenly I was good, said yes, that's, <laughs> that was very good, as he set the tone for all the questioning uh, coming afterwards. So I think uh, you should be very proud of what uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, what you have done. So many of you are are, are new, so that they, they weren't here last year. Uh, you weren't here last year, and uh, just a word on Sir Michael Stoker, who was the first uh, uh, the first chair of virology in uh, in the United Kingdom, and uh, he was the one who. Uh, set up the uh, um, the MRC unit for experimental pathology. So he is the one that raised the funds to uh, to um, set up Church Street. This is more than uh, 50 years ago, and it really was the Glasgow was at the center for virology in so many different ways. And uh, um, everybody in the world has uh, worked with uh, BHK uh, BHK 21 cells, and these are uh, saline that everybody used. But at that time, they were they were uh, um, uh, instrumental to understand some of the key events of cancer. And uh, we make this example in our center. We work with both human and animal viruses, and uh, and this BHK 21. It was also at the, in the board of uh, the Institute for Animal Health. And uh, he suggested to you to use BHK to grow the foot and mouth disease vaccines, and that has been instrumental for uh, uh, for develop that that vaccine. And this, in his notes, he was uh, uh, he was uh, um, uh, very interesting to read that uh, they managed to to get uh, a patent, and uh, the MRC made a lot of money, and then they gave us uh, some crumbles. Uh, they, they, they equated some crumble too. To us. As you know, uh, Sir Michael Stoker is not too well, he's in his 90s in, uh, in Cambridge, and last year we had his son Chris, who unfortunately could not come uh, today, but his, uh, he, he sends his, uh, his uh, best, uh, best regards, and he read a lot about uh, Vincent and what, uh, and, what, uh, and what he has done. So I think uh, we, I'll, I'll, stop, uh, I'll stop here. Thanks to you, because now I can't then can't say any more. And uh, we have Adam that will uh, introduce uh, specifically Vincent, and then they will have Vincent's lecture. Okay. Hello. Um, so, as Massimo has mentioned, um, this award is organised and um, voted on by the students and, and postdocs of the CBR. So, in actual fact, um, we had four nominees this year, but with fifty percent of the votes cast was um, Professor Rappaniello. So, Professor Rappaniello um, completed his PhD at the University of New York 
I hope all of this is right, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> At the University of New York, invest and it was on investigating genetic reassortment in um, influenza viruses. He then moved on to MIT as a postdoc, um, where he worked in the lab of David Baltimore, uh, where he started working on polio virus, before moving on to univers Columbia University, where he set up his own lab investigating the molecular biology behind the coronavirus, um, coronavirus pathogenesis. <laughs> So, as well as being known for his work on picanoviruses, Professor Racaniel is actually much more, is, is better known in a, in a wider field through his um, work at, sorry, <laughs> is, Professor Racaniel is um, known to a wider audience through his blogging and um, webcast that he does. So that's um, the Virology blog and uh, This Week in Virology, which are podcasts and blogs that are open to the general public. And if you do go on these, you actually do see um, comments from a much wider audience. So, um, without further ado, <laughs> I'd like to hand over to Professor Racaniello, who will be um, giving a presentation on uh, coronaviruses and antagonism of innate immunity. Thank you so much for that nice introduction. I want to thank all the students and postdocs for selecting me, at least half of you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and I realize that you wanted someone with a vowel at the end of his name. <laughs> Good chair. Uh, there, there is really no uh, greater honor than to be selected by uh, the young scientists of the future to give a lecture like this. And I can't tell you how honored I am to do this. I really appreciate it. Um, it's, it's the kind of thing I would never refuse to do. And I'm happy to spend time here with you. I've already spent a few sessions talking with you, and I've really enjoyed it. Uh, let, me, let me just leave you with one thing. I used to be a student and I used to be a postdoc. You can all do uh, what we are doing today if you want to. You're the foundation of science and without you, science ceases to exist. So don't ever think that you're unimportant uh, in any way because you're, you are the, the roots of the field and, and without you it doesn't grow anymore. So if you want to do something in science, you can do it. I can tell you that. I, I, I will be happy at another time to tell you about how my career developed, and it was very unplanned, uh, to say the least. But in the end, if you want to do virology, you'll do it. Just want to do it badly. <coughs> don't, ever, don't ever let anyone tell you that uh, you're not important to the field. Now, before I start talking about science, I want to just show you the, the desktop on my Mac here. Uh, this is actually an original watercolor by an artist uh, in Virginia, uh, named Michelle Banks, and she paints watercolors of micro with microbial themes. And I was uh, at an exhibition of hers last week, and I bought this uh, watercolor that I wanted to show you. So these, of course, are all different viruses here, uh, and I think she does a wonderful job at doing this. And there's a link to her website on my blog, virology.ws. Uh, where you can see uh, more of her work. It's really fabulous. I'll let you find uh, your favorite virus here uh, before I go on. I'm going to be telling you about a topic that's evolved over the 30 years that I've been doing virology. This goes back to the very beginnings of what I started uh, at Columbia. I'm going to tell you today about how we think the coronaviruses interact with and antagonize uh, innate immunity. Uh, but let me tell you a little bit about myself. I didn't just appear in a lab and automatically know how to do everything. I had mentors. Without mentors, we can't do anything. And I want to acknowledge uh, my two mentors. The first, Peter Palazzi, uh, in whose lab I did my PhD. That's at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City. I was Peter's first graduate student. So don't ever be afraid to be someone's first graduate student. It can be a really good experience. Peter was fabulous. I didn't mind that he asked me on a daily basis what was going on. That was great for me. Uh, this is his lab in Mount Sinai. It looked just like this uh, 30 years ago when I started working in it. In fact, I built these shelves here in the back. <laughs> uh, I went to visit a couple weeks ago to give a seminar. And I couldn't believe the shelves were, were still there. When I went to the lab, it was just a flat bench here. And I said, Peter, I need space. I need to put bottles. He said, okay, build some shelves. So he actually <laughs> took me down in his car downtown, and we bought shelves, and I assembled them. And that's another interesting motto. If you're 
PI says you should do something, I always figured they know more than I do, so I just did it. And it was good learning. It was good learning for me. Uh, here's me in Peter's lab, just to show how things change. So techniques change, but people change too. I had a lot of hair back then. Uh, I used to wear a, this is me pouring a sucrose gradient. I don't know if any of you know what a sucrose gradient is, at least not uh, under 30. Uh, we used to purify influenza viruses on these sucrose gradients. So here I am pouring one. And um, you notice that there's no bulb or thing on the end of the pipette, because we didn't have these automatic pipetters. I don't know what we used, but we didn't use that. Uh, and then I wore this lead apron, too. And we used to use a lot of P32. When I first went to the lab, Peter said, wear this lead apron. And so I said, he knows more than I do. I'll wear the red lead apron. Well, it turns out when you work with P32, you shouldn't wear a lead apron, right? <laughs> no, because the alpha particles activate a second particle, which then goes into you and is worse than the original. So <laughs> we, we eventually stopped using these lead aprons. Anyway, that's me circa 1977. Uh, after finishing in Peter's lab, I went to work with David Baltimore at MIT. And uh, here's a young David Baltimore, probably talking at the Asilomar conference or some, some aspect of recombinant DNA. When I went to his lab, the moratorium on recombinant DNA use in the U.S. had been lifted. So you could now clone entire viral genomes. You couldn't do it before. It was just a safety precaution because we didn't know if it would be dangerous. So I got to his lab and he said, Vinny, you can clone the entire polio genome. So, you know the answer. I did it because he's PI and he knows uh, more than I did. So we took the polio genome, we cloned it, we determined its sequence. And more importantly, we found that a plasmid containing the entire polio genome as a DNA copy was infectious when you, when you put it into cells. Uh, so I, I learned a great deal in, in David's lab. And on that strength, I went off to my job uh, at Columbia University in New York. And the story I want to tell you today really begins there. Of course, I learned how to do polio in, in David's lab, and I took that with me to New York. So the uh, virus I'll tell you about today is poliovirus. It's a small, uh, round icosahedral virus with a genome of plus-stranded RNA. Uh, here's an electron micrograph of the particles here in the upper left. Uh, you can see they're spherical looking in the EM. And the, it's composed of four different proteins, and they're arranged with icosahedral symmetry. So here is an icosahedron, and there are four poliovirus proteins, VP1, VP2, VP3, and VP4, the, the green one, which is internal. Uh, this subunit, the protomer, is repeated five times to make the pentamer, and then 12 times to make the virion. So you have 60 copies of each viral protein. Uh, here is a space filling model of the virion. The pentamers, two pentamers are shaded in gray, so you can get an idea of their orientation, and here is a single protomer. Again, five of those make up the pentamer. And you can see VP4 in green lies on the interior of the capsid. Now, this beautiful capsid, and there's no doubt that it's beautiful, is really just a carrier for what's inside. And that's, of course, the genetic information of the virus, the viral RNA. And the viral RNA, as we learned when we cloned and sequenced it back uh, in the 80s, it was about 7,400 nucleotides long. It's a plus-stranded RNA, which means it's a messenger RNA. It can be translated as it goes into cells. And it encodes a very long protein, which you call the polyprotein. The translation begins uh, at about 740 bases from the 5' end. Uh, the result is a long protein, which is processed by viral proteinases to become all the final uh, viral gene products, like the capsid proteins here on the left, and all the other proteins involved in uh, replication of the genome. In particular, the RNA polymerase here, two proteases, 3C and 2A, which we'll talk a little bit about today, and BPG, the uh, protein that's linked to the 5' end of the genome. These RNAs are unusual. They have a very structured 5' non-coding region. This is now called an iris, an inter internal ribosome entry site, which allows ribosomes to bind internally. When this virus infects a cell, it is typically taken up by endocytosis. All of the coronaviruses, we believe, at least as far as we know, are taken up by the endocytic pathway. This specific pathway varies depending on whether it's an enterovirus or another coronavirus. It can be clathrin-dependent or clathrin-independent. But the result is uh, exclusion of the viral RNA, 
uh, from the endosome into the cytoplasm. Some of these viruses require acidification, some of them do not. And again, because the RNA is plus stranded, it can be translated directly in the cytoplasm. The polyprotein is processed by the viral proteases, uh, and those proteins then go on to direct the rest of the infectious cycle, which involves the synthesis of viral RNA. This occurs on membranous vesicles that are induced by viral infection. Uh, and the synthesis of the captured proteins. And eventually the RNAs and the captured proteins assembled into new virions, which are then released from the cells. And we have historically believed that the cells lice releasing the virus, but there's now evidence for non-lytic release uh, via the <coughs> autophagic pathway, pathway from cells. This is a very quick replication cycle. It takes about six to eight hours from start to end. Now, the story I'm going to tell you today involves pathogenesis, so let me summarize very briefly the diseases that are caused by some of these viruses. So polio is a member of a genus within the papornavirus family called the enterovirus genus, and this contains uh, the polio viruses, the echoviruses, uh, Coxsackie viruses, as well as the rhinoviruses. Originally, the rhinoviruses were in a separate genus because they are transmitted by the respiratory route, but Sequence analysis shows that they should be grouped together in one genus. Unfortunately, we still have the name enterovirus, which to me is a little odd for a virus that initiates in the respiratory tract. But, uh, so we have been told by the committee that classifies viruses. Now, poliovirus and other enteroviruses are acquired when you ingest the virus. It replicates in the mucosal cells lining the oropharynx and the intestine. Virus is shed in the feces, and this is how it's spread from one person to another. And then eventually from uh, these epithelial cells, the virus gets beneath the basement membrane, it goes into the lymph system, and eventually goes in the blood. So there's a viremic stage for all of these uh, picornavirus infections, and the, the organ that's then targeted by the viremia differs depending on what virus is we're talking about. For polio, the virus enters the spinal cord and brain. It multiplies in neurons, and particularly motor neurons. It destroys them, and that causes the typical paralysis of poliomyelitis. Uh, other enteroviruses target different tissues like the skin, uh, muscle, or the meninges. So they each have a unique tropism. But polio is tropic for the brain and spinal cord, as well as the mucosal layer of the elementary tract. So this is one of the questions we'll be addressing today. What is responsible for this restricted tropism uh, of poliovirus infection? When I finished in David la David's lab uh, many years ago, I had done molecular biology. I had cloned the genome. I had sequenced it. I had made an infectious clone. But I wanted to use that to answer biological questions relating to disease. And at the time, there was no convenient animal model uh, for studying poliovirus pathogenesis, you had to use primates. And I didn't think I wanted to get into that moving to a new lab. So uh, one of the things I, I decided to do early on was to try and make a mouse model for the disease. So one of my first students, Kathy Mendelson, PhD student, uh, she cloned the, the human gene encoding the cell receptor for poliovirus. Uh, and this turned out to be a immunoglobulin-like protein with three extracellular domains. And the characteristic feature of this protein is that when you express it in a cell, such as a mouse cell, which does not have, uh, which is not able to bind polio, it confers polio binding to those cells. So mouse cells in culture, any mouse cell line, does not have receptors for polio. But if you express this gene in them, those cells will bind virus. And it turns out that most cells are already permissive for viral replication. So you add a receptor to these cells, the virus gets in and it multiplies. So Kathy showed that putting this gene into mouse cells and culture made them susceptible, as well as permissive they already are, of course. Uh, another student in my lab, Reeve Alvarez, a PhD student, then came in. He took the gene encoding this receptor. We had cloned a human genomic DNA fragment, uh, back then 35 kilobase fragment, we figured it had the promoter regulatory region. So we took that gene and put it in the transgenic mouse, made a transgenic mouse line, and these mice became uh, susceptible to infection as well. 
So you can see this animal has been inoculated with virus and it has rear hindlimb paralysis. So just giving the mouse the receptor was enough to make it a model for infection. This is really amazing because there's so many other blocks that could exist to virus infection in a mouse. It needn't just be the receptor, but we got very lucky. So we had a mouse model for disease, which we used for many years uh, to study a variety of aspects of polio pathogenesis. And I don't have time to tell you about them today. Uh, one of the aspects, though, was tropism. We wanted to know what regulated tropism. We're using a mouse model. We don't know if what we find in the model extends to humans, but that's how science works. You have to use uh, models and then see if you can test what you find in people. So this is this, a section of spinal cord from a transgenic mouse that had been inoculated with polio. It was paralyzed at the time the section was taken, and this is probed for poliovirus RNA. So these green dots show you where the virus is replicating. And you can see these are, these are largely uh, neurons. And you can tell by their size and shape. Uh, poliovirus is replicating only in the neurons. None of the other cells in the CNS uh, support replication. They need the astrocytes, the glial cells. No other cell here is infectable. And that's because only the neurons express the polio receptor in this transgenic mass model. So within the CNS, the tropism for neurons is dictated uh, by the receptor. However, in other tissues, that's not the case. And I'll show you a slide uh, which illustrates this. This is actually a slide uh, from a colleague of mine, Satoshi Koike in Japan, who was doing experiments at the same time that we were. I happened to like this slide very much. So here we have three different lines of mice. Wild-type mice, C57 black, polio receptor transgenic, and then a knockout of the type 1 interferon receptor. So wild-type mice cannot be infected with polio if you inoculate virus in them and then wait a few days and take out organs, homogenize them, and assay for a virus in a plaque assay. You see the gray bars here, very little virus multiplication, a little bit perhaps in spleen, uh, but for the most part, this is what we see, no virus replication. If you add the receptor transgene, the white bars, you can see now very good virus replication uh, in the brain and spinal cord, and lower elsewhere. Uh, Koiki finds, again, some multiplication in spleen and pancreas, but for the most part, tropism is directed towards the spinal cord. Now, at the time, many labs were trying to figure out what regulated this tropism. Why is the virus multiplying mainly in the brain and spinal cord? when in fact the receptor is in all of these tissues. If you assay it by Western blood or Northern analysis, any way you want, the poliovirus receptor is present in all of these tissues, yet they don't support virus replication. Why is that? Well, uh, a number of us in the field had the idea that it might be regulated by the interferon system. So that's why uh, Satoshi made a cross of the polio transgenic with these interferon knockouts. And you can see the result is the gray bars. The virus now replicates in every tissue. So you take away the interferon system, polio now will infect peripheral organs, which are normally protected uh, by the innate immune system. So this is what got us focused, or changed our focus in my lab, to innate immunity of the coronavirus infection. So what I want to tell you about today derives from this observation. And I'd like to tell you about how we're approaching understanding why the innate system regulates tropism in the periphery, and why it doesn't uh, protect the CNS. So in our polio transgenic mice, wild-type mice, the CNS is not protected. What's wrong with the innate immune system? So here's a summary of what we know in terms of innate immunity and for coronaviruses. As you know, when cells are infected by viruses, they can be sensed by the innate immune system. There are a variety of cytoplasmic and membrane-bound sensors. When infection is sensed, the cells respond by producing interferons, which then bind to the interferon receptors and induce the production of the mRNAs encoding the interferon-stimulated gene products. These are the effectors of the antiviral response. These are the proteins that have antiviral activity. And very famous ones are PKR, uh, RNA cell, MX, and there are many more. There are actually over a thousand of these genes now. People have studied this sensing over the years for various for coronaviruses, and they've learned, for example, that there can be antagonism of sensing. In fact, for all viruses that have been studied, 
Uh, the viruses are known to antagonize the innate system in three ways. At the level of sensing, at the level of production of interferons, and at the level of the production of ISGs. Uh, in coronavirus infected cells, we know that sensing can be abrogated. We know that the production of interferon can be abrogated, but no one had looked at uh, the activity of ISGs. And that's what we focused on. That's what I'd like to tell you about today. Now, we have also looked at the sensing of coronavirus infection, and we focused on the cytoplasmic sensors, rig I and MDA5. These are helicase-like proteins that detect either double-stranded RNA or 5-prime uh, phosphate-bound single-stranded RNA as foreign. These are typically not found in uninfected cells. Uh, when these sensors detect these proteins, they are activated, they initiate signaling cascades of various sorts through a variety of kinases, which end up in the uh, introduction or the migration of transcription factors uh, into the nucleus and the production of interferon uh, and messenger RNAs. So the sensing of RNA initiates the production of interferons. And we've in fact shown in our lab that in cells infected with a variety of coronaviruses, these sensors are cleaved, in fact, which may represent a mechanism of antagonism. We also find that IPS1, the mitochondrial-bound uh, protein, which is essential for initiation of these signaling cascades, is also cleaved as well. So the coronaviruses seem to be antagonizing uh, sensing at one level. In mice, it turns out that toll like receptor 3 is actually the most important sensor for coronavirus RNAs not rig I or MDA5. These seem to be important in cell culture. So uh, what I want to tell you about today is uh, the antagonism of interferon-stimulated genes uh, by poliovirus and how we went about studying that. And as I said, we've, we've shown that Bacornas antagonize sensing. Others have shown that Bacornas antagonize the production of interferons. And this was a largely unstudied part here, the interferon-stimulated genes. So uh, let me describe the assay that we used to do this. This is going to be used throughout the rest of the talk. We treat cells with interferon. We use interferon alpha. And we use HeLa cells because this is our standard uh, cell culture line that replicates polio really well. It's not biologically relevant, of course, but we can go on to test findings in relevant cell types. We treat with interferon overnight, and then we infect with the virus. And then we take time points after infection and measure virus production by a plaque assay. So if you do this experiment with the vesicular cellulitis virus, the canonical interferon-sensitive virus, you find that the virus grows very well in HeLa cells, the pink bars, but in interferon-treated cells, as you would expect, the virus doesn't grow. So our assay works as would be expected. If you do the same experiment with poliovirus, treat cells with interferon, infect, polio grows quite well, 1,000 PFU per cell in HeLa cells, it is inhibited by pretreating cells with interferon, but the virus can still replicate. So the replication is knocked down by about tenfold, but this is better than most viruses that we have seen in interferon treated cells. So we say the replication is relatively resistant to interferon. It's not completely resistant, but it does pretty well. Now, because we are treating cells with interferon, we assume that we have a collection of ISGs present when we infect, and therefore the virus may be antagonizing one or more of those interferons. So the first question we want to ask is, which uh, viral gene product is doing that? So to answer this question, we tried some co-infection experiments. We reasoned that if we put polio in a cell with an interferon-sensitive virus, we could determine whether polio was able to rescue that virus from inhibition. We tried initially to do this with VSV. But it didn't work because all the VSV mRNAs are capped, and polio inhibits translation of capped mRNAs. So that was not a useful experiment. So then we turn to another coronavirus, EMCV, which also is translated in a capped independent manner, like polio mRNAs by the iris, and it's also interferon sensitive. So we treat cells with interferon. Uh, if you infect with EMCV and titrate the virus yield, uh, uninfected cells is pink. The yield of EMCV is quite good. Uh, interferon-treated cells 
green EMCV does not replicate. If you contract cells with EMCV and polio, you see blue bars, you rescue EMCV replication to some extent. Not completely, but it does better than uh, in cells infected with just uh, in cells infected with only EMCV. There is some inhibition of polio directly on EMCV replication, which may prevent us from getting full rescue here. So this suggested to us that one of the polio gene products is, is altering the ISG environment so that EMCV can replicate. So which is the gene product? If you look at the uh, all of the polio proteins, we have the capsid proteins here. We have uh, proteins involved in RNA replication, particularly the polymerase and, and associated proteins. But of course, we have the two proteases, 2A and 3C. And the main function of these proteases is to cleave the viral polyprotein. But we also know that these proteases cleave cellular proteins. So 2A, for example, cleaves EIF4G and inhibits cap-dependent translation. 3C cleaves transcription factors that are needed for the synthesis of mRNA and other kinds of RNAs and cells. So it was logical to look at these initially. We collected some alleles uh, of these of viruses with changes in these proteases from other investigators, and we simply infect cells and ask if the, if the viruses are resistant to interferon. And what we found was that a mutation, single amino acid change in 2A, the 2A protease, uh, makes the virus sensitive to interferon. So here's the structure of 2A protease uh, of a papornavirus. This is the active site, and these are the three catalytic residues in yellow here. It had been shown by Richard Lloyd that changes at position 88, which is this red residue here, it's a tyrosine. This residue is not in the active site, but it's right near to it. Changes at this position altered the ability of 2A to cleave cellular proteins, but not viral proteins. So if you make a virus with this change, you, the virus will replicate, but it doesn't cleave cellular proteins. So we look at this one. We take a, a virus with a tyrosine change to either a leucine or a serine. We do the interferon sensitivity assay. And what you can see is that either virus is now completely sensitive to the treatment with interferon. Just the one amino acid change in the protease. The virus replicates normally, 1,000 PFU per cell yield, but completely sensitive, completely inhibited by interferon pre-treatment of cells. So this tells us that 2A protease is a main, a main player in antagonism of one or more ISGs. The next thing we did was ask, could we take 2A protease of poliovirus and put it into EMCV and that way make EMCV resistant to interferon? So this is, a again, a map of the polio genome on the top. And here's the 2A protease. We took that coding region and we inserted it into the EMCV genome. Here's the map of the EMCV polyprotein. It's generally similar to polio. It has an extra protein at the end terminus, the L protein. And its 2A, interestingly, is different from polio 2A. It is not a protease. It has other functions in the cell. So that's consistent with EMCV not uh, being able to grow in the presence of interferon. So we took the polio 2A, we put it into EMCV, we added it to the EMCV genome. We left the endogenous 2A there. We put it in in such a way that it would be cleaved by 3C protease. Now, this virus is infectious, and an assay for the activity of 2A is to see whether it will cleave a cellular protein, which would be EIF4G. So here's a Western blot for EIF4G. In cells infected with EMCV, the protein remains intact, as we know. And if you infect cells with uh, the recombinant virus, EP4, with the 2A protease, the polio4G is cleaved. So 2A is active and the virus is viral. If you do the interferon treatment experiment, uh, what you find is that, again, EMCV is inhibited by interferon. EMCV containing the polio 2A pro is able to replicate by virtue of having the 2A pro gene of polio in its genome. Now, the level of resistance is less than for polio. These experiments are done with 100 units per milliliter furon in the medium. All the other ones I've shown you were, were done with 1,000 units per mil. So we suspect that something in addition to 2A might be needed for full resistance to interferon. I'm going to tell you some work we're doing to address that in a moment. So 2A-PRO seems to be 
and a major player in uh, interferon resistance. And this extends not just to cells, but also to animals. Uh, EMCV is a virus of animals. It's a, it infects a variety of animals in the wild, and it also infects mice. When you infect mice into a peritoneally, the virus replicates in many organs, the CNS, the heart, pancreas, and eventually kills the animal. So if you infect mice intraperitoneally with uh, EMCV, about 10,000 PFU is the survival curve. Uh, here the open boxes is wild type virus. You see they're all dead by day six. If you mix the inoculum with interferon before putting it in the, the mouse, that protects the mice from lethality. So all the mice survive when you give interferon along with the virus. So it's a very interferon sensitive virus that makes sense. You now take EP4, the recombinant virus. That on its own, the open triangles, is a bit more lethal than uh, wild type EMCV. And in addition, if you mix interferon with the inoculum, those are the solid triangles, you don't get any protection of mice uh, from lethality. So, consistent with this virus being resistant to uh, interferon in cells, it also has a phenotype in mice as well. Now, what about the idea that other uh, viral proteins might be involved in conferring full interferon resistance in polio? We tried a genetic approach to answer this question. This, on this slide are the results of a plaque, what we call a placking efficiency. We take 100 PFU of virus uh, and we put it on cells that have been pretreated with interferon. And we cover the cells with an over, auger overlay, so we do a plaque assay. We count the number of plaques with and without interferon. So that's the plaquing efficiency, uh, the number of plaques with interferon over the number of plaques without. For polio, the number is one. Every plaque, uh, every infectious dose is able to form a plaque in the presence of interferon. With the MCV, the number is zero. You cannot get plaques on monolayers treated with interferon. Even if you put thousands of PFU onto the monolayer, if it's treated with interferon, there'll be no plaques. But if you take EP4 and plaque it out in this way with interferon treatment, you see you get about 1 in 100, 450 plaquing efficiency. So you can pick these individual plaques. The assumption is they are mutants that have acquired a mutation in a gene that enhances the, the resistance of the virus to interferon. So we pick um, a number of these plaques from monolayers infected with EP4, and that's shown here, EP4, A, B, C, or D. So these are secondary isolates. These have a, a range of resistance. You can see some are more resistant to interferon, 1 in 4 plaquing efficiency compared to 1 in 450. Uh, so this is at 100 units per mil interferon. We then step it up to 1,000 units per mil. Uh, EMCV EP4 cannot make, make plaques at 1,000 units per mil, so you have to do a stepwise selection. Polio, every plaque, every virus makes a plaque at 1,000 units per mil, it's remarkably resistant. Uh, EP4A, which was selected here, uh, 1 to 4, uh, forms plaques at 1,000 units per mil, about 1 to 60, and we picked a number of other isolates from EP4A as well here. So these presumably contain mutations and other genes that may collaborate with 2A to make the full resistance phenotype. So we sequence uh, the genomes of some of these viruses. Uh, we sequence EP4C here, which is fairly resistant to 100 units per mil. It has mutations in a captured protein and in a protein that is uh, involved in RNA replication. Uh, and here, EP4A2 has mutations in captured proteins, uh, as well as the 3C protease which is interesting, so that could collaborate with 2A. And another isolate also has <coughs> mutations. This one is in the L protein. Now, this is a protein that's only present in EMCV and not polio. So it would be interesting to see how that might be collaborating with 2A and then uh, again in 3C. Now, we're presently introducing these individually into the virus to confirm which ones uh, make the virus resistant to high levels of interferon in this kind of an assay. And once we know that, we can then explore how they collaborate with 2A. So the assumption is that even in polio, there are perhaps other proteins, and this may give us uh, an indicator of what those proteins might be that collaborate with uh, 2A. So that sets the stage for the next question, which is um, which ISGs are antagonized by 2A pro? We know that 2A pro is a major player in antagonizing an ISG. Which are the ones? There are over a thousand ISGs in the database, if you just look at genes that are 
whose levels of mRNA are turned up when you treat cells with interferon. There are over a thousand such genes. So you have to devise some kind of screen to figure out which are inhibitory to polio and then of those which are antagonized by 2 n So we collaborated with uh, John Choggins in the Rice Lab at Rockefeller, and we did a screen, an overexpression screen to identify ISGs that inhibit polio. So let me describe this, this screen to you. What John did was to take 350 ISG cDNAs and clone them into an expression vector. Uh, this vector uh, has an iris-driving red fluorescent protein, so you can mark, you can monitor expressing cells by their red color. Uh, you, you then transduce these vectors individually into cells. They will be red, and then you infect with virus. And you want to have for this assay a virus with a different fluorescent color so that you can assay the results by flow cytometry. So we were fortunate to identify a variant of polio containing green fluorescent protein that had been made by Ellie Merenfeld's lab uh, sometime before this. And interestingly, what had been done in Ellie's lab, uh, they did a transposon screen to identify where in the polio genome you can insert foreign genes. And they scanned the entire genome. There's only one place where you can put GFP in the polio genome, and that's in the 2A protease gene near the C terminus, near the position 88 that we know when, which when mutated makes the virus sensitive to interferon. So we have a green fluorescent protein expressing polio, plus it's sensitive to interferon, which is exactly what we want for this assay. We don't want to use polio, wild type polio, because they're not going to get much inhibition. So we get green polio and we get a sensitive virus to interferon. So we run the assay and then we pick up inhibitory or non-inhibitory ISGs based on whether uh, they inhibit virus replication uh, in, in co-expressing cells, which you can do by flow cytometry. Uh, the cells expressing both the uh, red and the green are yellow, and you can see the, the magnitude of the inhibition by counting cells there. So uh, these are the results that we obtained. These are ISGs that inhibit and, in fact, enhance uh, poliovirus replication. So here's the, the graph of the findings, uh, and this is normalized replication, which is the percent GFP positive cells in a red population. All of it's been normalized to a control vector. Instead of an ISG in the vector, we have uh, firefly luciferase. So you can see some uh, ISGs stimulate, in particular MAP3 kinase, MAP kinase 5 is the most stimulatory, but many of them also inhibit. Most of them don't do anything. You can see right here in the middle. Uh, some of them are very inhibitory, including IRF1, uh, APOL6, and TRIM25, and others less so. Here's the full list here, and I'll tell you a little bit about these. Now, IRF1 inhibits just about every virus that's been tested. IRF1 is a transcriptional activator that activates uh, at least 100 different genes in the human genome, so presumably those also have antiviral activity. And so it's not a gene that we want to follow up. We would like to identify ISGs with direct antiviral activity. We validated these findings in a bona fide replication asset. Now, the screen that I just described to you only monitors for uptake of virus and expression of the genome. It doesn't monitor late events in infection. We're just looking at green fluorescence. We did a complete growth cycle to validate those findings. What we do is we transduce each individual ISG into cells. We let it express, and then we infect, and 16 hours later, we lyse the cells, and we titrate by plaque acid. So we're looking at total virus production at 16 hours post-infection. And expressed here in PFU per cell, wild type, uh, sorry, firefly luciferase control, 4,000 PFU per cell. And you can see IRF1 inhibits very nicely. Uh, APOL6, TRIM25, TRAC-D1, etc. These are actually in the order of the preceding slide, which is right here, the most uh, inhibitory to the least inhibitory. So IRF1 is the most, OASL is the least, and you can see they're lined up in the same way here. So we have some very inhibitory ISGs and other, others less so. Uh, the stimulatory ISGs did not stimulate virus production. They only seem to stimulate the production of green fluorescent protein. So we're not sure if those are simply translational activators or they're acting in some other way. So we're focusing now on 
some of these inhibitors. Let me tell you just a little bit about some of them. Uh, as I said, IRF1 is the most potent inhibitor of many viruses that are tested. This is a complete growth curve assessing the effect of overexpressing IRF1 in cells uh, versus a firefly luciferase control. So here's replication of polio uh, over time, good production per cell, uh, and a very quick assay, and a very quick cycle, and uh, IRF1 uh, substantially knocks down the amount of virus produced and it, and it endures. Uh, in contrast, APOL6, the effect initially is good in pink here, it inhibits virus replication, but eventually uh, the virus does catch up probably as amounts of the protein are going down, and also because this is just one inhibitory protein, whereas IRF1, remember, is, in, is activating over 100 other proteins, many of which uh, could be inhibitory. Some of the ISGs that inhibit viral replication that we're going to look at include these three, uh, with no known function. So if you look in the gene database, no one knows what these do. It could be interesting to study these. They might reveal novel cellular functions. So we're, we're initially pursuing these to, to see their effects on, to see what parts of the viral replication cycle they are affecting. ApoL6 is the second most inhibitory ISG. Uh, this encodes apolipoprotein 6. It's involved in lipid transport and uh, binding lipids to organelles. ACSL1 is another uh, protein involved in lipid biosynthesis. It's a fatty acid coenzyme A ligase. These two are interesting to us because the viral RNA replicates on the surface of membranous vesicles that are reduced uh, by virus replication. Very early in infection, cells, of course, are full of ER and Golgi. But just a few hours after polio infection, the ER and Golgi disappear. And they're replaced by a membranous network uh, of various vesicles of different origins. And that's on the surface of these that the virus RNA replicates. So these ISGs could be inhibiting by targeting this part uh, of the replication cycle. TDRG7 is a component of cytoplasmic RNA granules. Uh, these form in response to various stresses on a cell, including virus infection. The effect is to shunt translating mRNAs into discrete granules where the mRNAs are no longer translated. Many viruses antagonize the formation of stress granules because they're, they're negative for virus replication, of course. Uh, so West Nile, dengue, and polio all antagonize stress granule formation. In particular, polio, the 3C protease cleaves one of the structural components. So it could be that TDRD7 reverses polio antagonism, and in that way is an antiviral protein. Another inhibitor is CRIM25, which is required for Rig I activity, and this may just be activating more Rig I and sensing more, or it could have a Rig I independent function, which we, which we plan to look at. ZBP1 is a cytoplasmic DNA sensor, which probably is not involved in sensing polio. Uh, two proteins may be involved in virus entry. One is uh, a protein involved in early endosome transport, another is a receptor on the cell surface, and as I said, uh, poliovirus binds a receptor and is taken up into cells by endocytosis, and these could interfere with those steps. So all of these are readily assayable steps, and we can ask very readily how um, these ISGs inhibit steps of the replication cycle. Now, at the end, I would like to turn to the other question, and that is, why is the CNS infected? Why isn't it protected by the ISG response? Remember, in just the polio transgenic mice, it's largely the CNS that is infected. The other tissues seem to be protected by the interferon response. Others have shown that, in fact, the ISG expression levels are much lower in the CNS versus peripheral tissues, at, at least in mice that are infected with polio virus. So this suggests to us that there is some problem in ISG expression in the brain, and perhaps that is why polio is able uh, to replicate there. So the question is, why is ISG production defective? Um, we looked for a model to study this because we didn't think it would be good to do this in mice. This, this is a kind of a problem where you really need a cell line to do. And let me tell you what, what we have found. And to do this, I need to go back in time a bit and tell you about work we did a number of years ago when we were studying uh, the polio Sabin vaccine strains. These are viruses made by Albert Sabin. 
and which are used for the global eradication effort uh, of polio. There are three serotypes, and these are infectious attenuated vaccine strains which are ingested, they replicate in your intestine, and they provide intestinal immunity without paralysis. <clears throat> these viruses were selected empirically by Albert Sabin. and they are mutants of wild-type viruses with a, a finite number of mutations in their genomes that confer the attenuation phenotype. You can see in particular all three serotypes of the vaccines can have a change in the 5' prime non-coding region of the genome. And I'll remind you that at the very 5' prime end of polio RNA is a highly structured internal ribosome entry site. Sabin's three vaccine strains all have mutations in this stem loop number five, right here, and you can see that expanded on the right, the type one, the type two, and the type three vaccine strain mutations. And we believed when we identified these that they interfered with translation because this whole structure is involved in, in translation of the viral mRNA. And to, do, to understand if that was the case, we looked for a cell line that would duplicate the effects of these individual attenuating mutations. Now, if you infect mice with poliovirus, uh, you can see the effect of this single base change in the 5' non-coding region on virus replication. So here we're looking at the base at 472, which is the determinant of attenuation in the type 3 Sabin vaccine strain. The vaccine has a U. If you infect mice with a virus with a U at that position, uh, the mice are never paralyzed, and the virus is cleared from the CNS. This is a time course of virus multiplication, PFU per gram of brain versus day post-infection. So the U-containing virus is attenuated and doesn't replicate well in the brain. C-containing virus, on the other hand, replicates quite well in the mouse brain and has an LD50 of about 9,000 PFU. So 9,000 PFU will paralyze about half the mice. So this is the phenotype we wanted to study. We wanted to know what was the functional basis for why one base change of 472 created this attenuated <coughs> phenotype. So when we did this, we found that a neuroblastoma cell line was sensitive to the base at 472. This is a human neuroblastoma cell line, uh, SY5Y. We also used SKNSH uh, versus HeLa cells. So in HeLa cells, whether you have a C or a U, at 472 matters not at all. Both viruses replicate very well in HeLa cells. So HeLa cells cannot distinguish between a C or a U at 472. But the neuroblastoma cells can. If you have a C at 472, the viruses replicate quite well. These are just growth curves over time, virus production from cells and culture. You put a U at 472, you see that the virus doesn't replicate. So neuroblastoma cells can distinguish uh, what base is present at 472. We use these cells to dissect uh, the role of that base change in translation, showing that, in fact, it reduces translation. Couldn't do that in mice very readily. So when we were investigating the problem with ISGs in the mouse brain, we said, let's take a look at these neuroblastoma cells, and maybe they mimic the CNS in the same way as, as they mimic the, the response to this base at 472. So the question is, do these neuroblastomas mount a suboptimal antiviral response? We treat the cells with interferon overnight, just as I told you earlier. We have the neuroblastoma cells, and we have HeLa cells. We treat with uh, different amounts of interferon from 0 to 1,000 uh, units per mil. And then we infect with poliovirus at different multiplicities, as you can see here. So in HeLa cells, there is a dose-dependent inhibition of viral replication. Uh, at an MY of 10, you can see 90% inhibition or so, which is what we see in the, in the earlier assays that I showed you. Uh, in, in the neuroblastoma cells, however, there's no inhibition of viral replication. So the cells do not appear to mount an antiviral response, even when challenged by uh, interferon. We know these cells have interferon receptors. As you will see, they do respond uh, by making certain ISGs. Here's another kind of assay that asks you the same question. Uh, you infect HeLa cells with poliovirus, as I've shown you before. 
Uh, wild type polio, the virus grows quite well. If you treat with interferon, about a 90% inhibition of replication. But again, in nest and SH cells, there's very little inhibition by treatment with interferon. And here is our polio mutant, which has a one amino acid change, making it completely sensitive to interferon. HeLa cells without treatment, with treatment, virus replication is inhibited. That's the expected phenotype. And again, in SK and SH cells, minimal effect of interferon treatment. And again, remember, this is a virus that is inhibited by treatment with interferon. So clearly, there's something wrong in SK and SK and SH cells' response to exogenous interferon. So we asked them, what is the problem with uh, SK and SH cells? Uh, are, are there particular ISGs defective, or are all of them defective? So we began to look at individual uh, ISGs by uh, real-time PCR. So we have three different treatments here. We infect with polio or EMCD, <coughs> or we treat with interferon alpha. And then at different times after infection, we take samples of the cells and we measure uh, ISG RNA by real-time PCR. And what we find is that basically under most conditions, interferon, polio infection, EMC infection, the neuroblastoma cells seem to respond appropriately. They make ISG. They don't seem to have an overall defect. But what we noted was APOL6 in particular uh, is defective in its expression in SK and SH cells. So uh, if the gray bars here is the expression of APOL6. In, in either polio infection or EMCV infection, uh, the expression is defective. And remember, this is one of the inhibitory ISGs for polio. So this could explain why the virus is able to grow uh, unimpeded in SK and SH cells by interferon treatment. And it may also explain the susceptibility of the brain to virus infection. So that's something we can test. We can restore, uh, we can look at APOL6 expression in the mouse brain to see if it's indeed defective. And then we can try and restore it and perhaps protect uh, the CNS from infection. It turns out that this is one of the key causes. It will be interesting to find out why its expression is defective. Perhaps it's particularly deleterious to have this protein made in the brain, and therefore it's been selected against uh, the evolution. So this is where we stand, and what remains for us to do is to figure out how the antiviral ISG proteins work, how they inhibit polio how 2A inhibits their activity and how it collaborates with other viral proteins. And then, as I told you, using uh, SK and SH cells as a model uh, for understanding what's going on with the innate response in the CNS. So we basically use polio as a model system to understand how the CNS is responding to infection. <clears throat> so I, I work at Columbia University and New York City, and that's, uh, this is our medical campus right here, and um, this is our building here. We have a wonderful view of the uh, George Washington Bridge. This is the Hudson River. This whole neighborhood is called Fort Washington. Uh, we had a revolution many years ago in the U.S. We were fighting the British, and some of the battles were fought up here. And George Washington was running around at the time directing his troops. There were no buildings at the time. It was just woods, but that's why it's called Fort Washington. So. We have a little history, too. Uh, not as much as Europe, but we have some history in the U.S. And this is a day where the fog has rolled in over the Hudson River. Very pretty. Uh, the work I told you about was done by Julianne Marson when she was a student in, in my lab. She is currently a postdoc with Adolfo Garcia Sastre at Mount Sinai. And also by Rhea Davalik, a postdoc in my lab in collaboration with uh, the Rice Lab and John Shoggins. Um, and as you heard earlier, we do also try to educate the public about science. I started three different podcasts, which you can find at this website. And these are basically conversations with my colleagues about viruses, about bacteria, about parasites. And we have upwards of 100,000 people listening to these every month. And people come from all walks of life, and they learn about science this way. I think this is a good way that a scientist can teach science to the public because the internet makes it very easy to disseminate. We put these on iTunes and all over the internet and they're free uh, for everyone to listen to. And in fact, we will be recording one tomorrow uh, in, in Glasgow at this wonderful Virology Institute. So uh, you might be interested in coming by and, and listening to how it's done. 
So I want to thank you again for having me here. I really appreciate it. I hope you uh, enjoy a little snapshot of the work that we do. And I'm looking forward to talking with uh, more of you today and tomorrow. Couple of uh, logistic issues before uh, before I forget. So tomorrow's uh, podcast uh, uh, with uh, Vincent will be at uh, ten o'clock uh, in the morning in uh, Church Street at, uh, in the Golovkin Room. So I hope that uh, uh, most of you can make it. And uh, tomorrow, I, I think if, uh, uh, if the plans haven't changed, we'll uh, talk about uh, the Hep C both at the local at the local uh, C at the local level and the global level. We have. Uh, we're hosting uh, Dr. Hunter Ramansi from the uh, World Health Organization in Geneva who is uh, visiting us and uh, we're discussing ways how we can uh, uh, collaborate uh, with uh, WHO on, uh, on Hep C and uh, we'll talk about also some uh, uh, how studies on animal viruses have uh, inspired uh, many uh, uh, seminal contributions in the biomedical area. Um, so again, the, the, the podcast will be at 10 o'clock uh, tomorrow morning in the colloquium room. And after the seminar, I think we'll have time for a, for a couple of questions, two three questions, and then we can uh, all uh, walk. Uh, uh, we'll have a presentation uh, uh, to Vincent, and then we can uh, uh, walk for uh, a reception at the bottom. What's the name of the building? The church. Search words on the building. So the church at the bottom of uh, University uh, University Avenue. Unfortunately, there are many. Uh, uh, lecture theaters at, at this moment are being refurbished, so we, we had a bit of a logistic issues to, to fit uh, to fit everything. So, do we have uh, any questions for uh, for Vincent, Chris? We looked at the stability of MAVS and your proteases. So, the question is: Are viral proteasing proteases cleaving MAVS? MAVS yeah. <coughs> sure. MAVS is cleaved um, in cells infected with polio, and it um, it seems to be cleaved by. This is, it's very interesting. Both viral proteases can cleave it, as well as cellular caspases, which are activated as the virus induces apoptosis. So it seems like overkill, but maybe it's really important to get rid of it. Yeah, the on knockout mice for the that's an interesting question. So, in the interferon knockout mice, the receptor knockouts, do are, are there any phenotypes? So, the mice die rapidly of paralysis. So, it's it, and there is quite a bit of virus replication in the other tissues. So, it's hard to tell. Um, I would not be surprised because it's it's in heart, pancreas, muscle. Liver, so they're, they're, if you could somehow delay the CNS, you might get at that, but or measure other parameters, liver enzymes, or something like that. But we haven't done that. Um, may I ask you, maybe this is a way also to show students if you should never be intimidated to ask a stupid question. <laughs> so, my stupid question is that a lot of, uh, of uh, you know, going back and, and virology, a lot of the systems you in vivo, you have inoculation on newborn mice to, mm -hmm. to uh, intracerebrally, right. and you have a phenotype one effective effect that, that uh, mouse and other other ways you don't actually get much out of it. Uh, so, what what is uh, what why okay why is that is that so in our hands uh, newborn mice are far more susceptible to polio viruses than adult mice. For here's an example. If you take an adult mouse and you inject the Sabin vaccine strain into the brain, the mouse is fine. But if you take a newborn and put the same virus in the brain, the mouse will become paralyzed. And I think it's because of an immature immune system. I don't know exactly what aspect is immature, um, but I think that even the vaccine strains under those conditions can overwhelm the animal. So in, in fact, in viruses in general, if you want to look at an animal with a very poorly developed immune system. That's one way to do it, is to do the newborn mice, basically. Okay. Fine. Uh, the phenotype in the wild type adult mice, do you know what contribution 
So you'd have to be in a tight. You said the virus having a direct cytomatic right. effect, or is it primarily a secondary effect using the inflammatory? Yes. It's a question I've been wondering for years. The, the CNS damage, is it virus-induced or, or a consequence of the immune response? I don't know the answer. The, the experiment has not been done. There, there are a number of things you could do uh, to answer that. Um, but if you look in many of the older textbooks, um, they all say polio is a lytic virus, therefore the neuronal damage is caused by the virus. But there is no evidence that that's the only cause. But so, these experiments are now being done in a variety of labs, so maybe we, we could answer that in a couple of years. Um, not, not at the moment. Maybe we can, uh, let's say we also have a WHO uh, uh, representative. How do you feel in terms of polio eradication and what are the pro and cons of that? Polio eradication is great. I mean, why would you want to have it around at all? I mean, it's, we're almost there. It's, it's, we've, they have done amazing progress in India, for example, which now hasn't had a case in over a year. And now the, the key is to get it down in the remaining three countries where it's endemic. And um, that'll be hard, but I think it can be done. The real question is, what if we eradicated all infectious diseases? Would it be bad for us? Somebody asked me that the other day. All infectious diseases. So I think if you define an infectious disease as something that makes you sick, then it's fine to get rid of HIV and uh, measles and mumps and hep C and all of those. Hep B, it's great. I don't think that they give us any benefit. But we do have plenty of microbes that are good for us, including viruses, most likely. So you don't want to get rid of those. OK, so I guess the question afterwards is what we're going to do about it. Uh, this center, I'm sure we'll find <laughs> something to do. So I think now we'll ask uh, uh, Maxime and Kevin to present. Uh, so we are very pleased to um, give you the prize of uh, the Michael Zucker Award, which is uh, I think a frame with viruses. <laughs> <laughs> And the band more <laughs>